Um, I'm assigned to do the unreliable bladder, uh, something that will you will find out can be a very challenging um, aspect of your practice um, in urology. Now, when, when a female presents in a urologist clinic, uh, the most common complaints are those pertaining to the lower urinary tract. And on occasions when these symptoms are not due to uh, urinary tract infection or bladder cystitis, uh, the complaints of weak stream, intermittency, nocturia, etc., urinary incontinence must be thought to be due to either a failure to empty or a failure to store. Now, these two are very different pathophysiologic mechanisms that underpin the symptoms. Hence, uh, thereby, it, it, it arose uh, this concept of the bladder as an unreliable witness. Uh, the clinical conditions uh, listed below at the bottom of the slide, um, each being either a problem of storage or a problem of emptying, um, will present with the same set of symptoms, albeit to a different degrees and um, different combinations. Now, my presentation this afternoon uh, will focus on the first three uh, conditions. Now, one of the more important concepts of female urology is a good understanding of the differences in terminology when it comes to diagnosing conditions affecting voiding and the lower urinary tract, as this is promoted by the in, uh, International Continent Society. Um, in case of the chooser overactivity and the overactive bladder, I'm sure you can appreciate that conceptually, these two conditions are similar. But note that the diagnosis of the chooser overactivity requires the performance of urodynamics because it um, demands that there must be a demonstration of uh, involuntary detrusor contractions during a filling systometry. On the other hand, the diagnosis of an overactive bladder only requires uh, the presence of symptoms of urgency, frequency, nocturia, and at times uh, urinary incontinence. Similarly, the distinction between um, the diagnosis of the trusor underactivity and the underactive bladder um, is the need for urodynamic findings on the status of the detrusor pressure, the trusor contraction, and flow rate in the former, and just the presence of complaints of uh, obstructive LUTs uh, for the latter. And I'm sure uh, you are all familiar with the definition of bladder outlet obstruction from your male BPH patients, which is a urodynamic diagnosis based on the findings of an increased detrusor pressure and a reduced urinary flow. Now, specific pathophysiologic mechanisms behind these conditions involve either impairment of the neural pathways and the receptors of the lower urinary tract, or abnormalities in the detrusor muscle itself, or the malfunctioning of the urethral sphincter or the pelvic floor muscles. Recently, uh, recent studies have described these pathologies down to the even the subcellular and cellular levels. Now, assessing the lower urinary tract symptoms in women involves uh, many things. No? It is recommended that history taking involving uh, the use of validated condition specific symptom questionnaires such as the ICS flux, OABSS, among many others, uh, as part of the normal history taking. Now, bladder palpation is particularly important when suspecting uh, detrusor under activity or bladder outlet obstruction. Completing a voiding diary is a critical tool for the assessment of the overactive bladder. Urinalysis, on the other hand, screens for urinary tract infection, which could present as lower urinary tract symptoms in women. Now, post void residual measurement, mainly through the use of the ultrasound, um, is, an part, is an important part of the assessment of the underactive bladder or, the bl or bladder outlet obstruction. And finally, there's urodynamics, and this is the assessment tool that I would consider as a key, the, the key diagnostic tool for avoiding dysfunction. Now, I'm sure you've heard uh, a, a very good lecture on urodynamics earlier and the principles of neurourology earlier. 
And um, so you'll know that the urodynamics is a study of the hydrodynamics of the ur lower urinary tract. And um, in female urology, it is used as an adjunct to confirm or, di or con to provide or confirm a diagnosis. In some cases, it has been used to predict treatment outcomes, such as predicting success of surgical treatment or the probability of the occurrence of adverse outcomes after a proposed treatment. Now, this is a point of controversy, especially in female urology, because several trials have been done, which uh, did not show any significant benefit in terms of uh, better outcomes among patients who underwent pretreatment urodynamics compared to those who were managed based on clinical assessment alone, as presented uh, by the first speaker earlier. However, some clinicians still advocate the use of urodynamics, particularly in complicated cases and in cases that present as diagnostic dilemmas or treatment failures. Now, there are many forms of urodynamic studies from simple uroflometry to the classic pressure flow study to the more complex forms of ambulatory urodynamics, video urodynamics, and urethral pressure uh, profilometry. And each form has its own indications uh, for use, but uh, this will not be within the sp scope of my lecture uh, today. Now, when performing urodynamics, uh, one should adhere to, this, to these principles presented here. The study should be uh, performed with a clear indication of a very clear clinical question to be answered. And it it has to be performed uh, replicating patient symptoms and according to standards with good quality control. Hence, I encourage all the trainees out there to read and understand the good urodynamics practice document of the International Continent Society. I'm pretty sure important lessons can be learned and answers to a few of your examination questions may be found in that document. Now, one of the major limitations in the clinical uh, utility of urodynamics in women with uh, voiding dysfunction, whether it's underactivity or overactivity, is the lack of uh, universally accepted diagnostic criteria, particularly for uh, the females. Most of the studies on urodynamic cutoffs, value cutoffs, and parameter variables were developed for and validated among women. Uh, I, mean, I mean, among men rather than for women. Now let's go through the use of urodynamics in the different clinical conditions of uh, detrusor overactivity, underactivity, and bladder outlet obstruction. Now in the context of OAB and detrusor overactivity, urodynamics is helpful in establishing the diagnosis um, by demonstrating phasic detrusor pressure rises during filling systometry. Trials that looked into the impact of performing urodynamics among women with OAB showed that it led to an increased likelihood of prescribing drugs and avoiding surgery, but it did not um, significantly improve treatment outcomes. Hence, it is not recommended as a routine test for women with uncomplicated overactive bladder overactive bladder. Now for women presenting with voiding dysfunction or obstructive lower urinary tract symptoms, urodynamics is the only test that can reliably distinguish the true underactivity from bladder outlet obstruction. It is here now where the limitation of urodynamics in women comes to fore in the case of the true underactivity, especially. One must remember that some women, some normal women, can void perfectly well without raising the detrusor pressure and just by relaxing the sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles. Hence, different indices have been used to increase the accuracy of urodynamics for the underactive bladder. The more commonly used uh, urodynamics criteria for detrusor underactivity is a combination of a Qmax of less than 12 mils per second and a post void residual uh, volume of, uh, more, uh, of more than 150 mils. A bladder voiding efficiency value of less than 90% using the formula shown here in this slide 
also could signal a possible detrusor under activity, although I'm sure you know that a low BVE value may also be seen in bladder outlet obstruction. Now, when performing a pressure flow study, a combination of a P dead Q max of less than 20, or sometimes they put it at 30 centimeters water, and a low Q max of less than 10 or 15 ml per second during the voiding phase has been used as a diagnostic criteria for detrusor underactivity. Another index that uses both the P dead Q max and the Q max is the bladder contractility index, where when you find get a value of less than 100 suggests the truser under activity. Now for the diagnosis of bladder outlet obstruction, neurodynamics is the main stage, specifically uh, using the pressure flow study type of neurodynamics. The classic definition of bladder outlet obstruction is low flow, high detrusor pressure. The main issue, however, in women is that the criteria of low flow less than 15 mils per second and a high detrusor pressure of more than 40 centimeters water has not been validated in females. Hence, several nomograms have instead been proposed to uh, better define bladder outlet obstruction in women, mainly the, uh, using the combination of Qmax and P dead Qmax values again. Examples of these nomograms include the Blavis Grouts and the Solomon Greenwell uh, nomograms. And the addition of imaging uh, during urodynamic study has also been advocated for diagnosing bladder outlet obstruction. The demonstration of a proximal urethral dilatation with distal narrowing during voiding or a tight non-relaxing bladder neck associated with a high detrusor pressure confirms bladder outlet obstruction. Now, the management of these conditions may be classified into conservative, pharmacological, or surgical. Conservative management for women with voiding dysfunction includes all these strategies presented here, regardless of uh, what type of voiding dysfunction they have. Lifestyle changes such as weight loss, proper fluid intake, limited caffeine and alcohol uh, intake have been shown to improve, for example, overactive bladder symptoms. Pelvic floor exercises, whether they focus on contracting or relaxing the pelvic floor muscles, provide some relief for both overactive and underactive bladder symptoms. Behavioral modification, particularly bladder retraining, has been shown in randomized trials to improve OAB, particularly in reducing urgency incontinence episodes. Electrical stimulation may improve symptoms of OAB in some women. The type and mode of delivery of this electrical stimulation remains variable and poorly standardized. Now, finally, catheterization can, is the mainstay in the conservative management of the um, um, underactive bladder. Now in the latest or soon to be out EAU guidelines on the management of female LUTs, the following drugs have been, will be recommended for the management of uh, these three conditions. Anti-muscarinic agents are the mainstay in the pharmacologic management of OAB. Uh, based on the efficacy and safety evidence from systematic reviews of trials comparing these drugs with placebo. A relatively new player in the OAB sphere is the beta agonist such as Mirabegron. Systematic reviews have demonstrated that Mirabegron is better than placebo and is as efficacious as anti-muscarinics in the improvement of OAB symptoms. Um, OAB, especially as a component of a genital urinary syndrome of menopause, can be effectively improved by vaginal estrogens based on randomized trials. For the underactive bladder, there's limited trial data that is suggestive of a benefit from the use of alpha blockers. For functional bladder outlet obstruction, randomized trials suggest that some improvement of symptoms may be and urodynamic parameters may be expected with the use of alpha blockers and striated muscle relaxants. Now, in terms of surgical management, as you will note across the three conditions, 
sacral neuromodulation and botulinum toxin injection may be used. This highlights the neurologic pathophysiologic mechanisms that underlie these conditions. For the chooser overactivity or the uh, overactive bladder, randomized trials have shown that even a single intradetrusor botulinum toxin injection provided significant um, benefit in reducing OAB symptoms and urgency urinary incontinence episodes. Patients may be advised, must be advised though of a small risk of urinary retention and UTI post uh, injection. For patients who are non-responsive to medical and conservative management of OAB, trials have shown that sacral neuromodulation is of benefit. Now for the chooser under activity, sacral neuromodulation works through the activation of the afferent pathways or the inhibition of inappropriate guarding mechanism that and then therefore facilitating uh, bladder emptying. Small trials have shown that signif there are significant increases in voided volumes and reductions in post-void residuals in women with underactive bladder after sacral neuromodulation. Now, botulinum toxin injection to the striated sphincter and transurethral incision of the bladder neck both aim to decrease outflow resistance and allow better voiding even with a weak bladder. Now, there is evidence supporting these uh, surgical techniques to improve voiding in women with underactive bladder, although the, the trials are limited to small case series. Uh, the same holds true for the effectiveness of these two surgical techniques in women with functional bladder outlet obstruction. Now, for anatomical bladder outlet obstruction, urethral dilatation, urethrotomy, transurethral incision of the bladder neck, urethroplasty, and urethrolysis have all been shown in case series to provide improvements in the symptoms and urodynamic parameters of affect women affected with bladder outlet obstruction. I think that's uh, about what I can share with you um, this afternoon. So thank you.